What's up? What's up? What's up? This is Simon. You're watching Cryptechology. All right. So what are we going to talk about today? Helium again, of course. Why? Because this is what that channel is about. I talk about Helium and some other crypto projects as well. So stay tuned for those and a little bit of TA. But now back to Helium. We need to bring it back, back, back to the beginning. OK, so let's find out what this blockchain is really about. I did not mean to click on that button. I am so sorry. Let's get this back up. There we go. <laughs> so what we're going to do in this little series that I've put together, um, we're going to go over the Helium blog and let's provide some more content for everybody on Helium. Let's go back to the beginning, introducing the Helium blockchain. Now, there's going to be two ways on why I'm making this because I don't really like reading. <laughs> so I'm doing this because I'm sure there are others that don't really like reading and would rather just listen to it. Uh, so here we go, introducing the Helium blockchain. The internet we have today dates back a long, long time, back in the days when ARPANET was designed, which eventually became the internet. There were only a handful of sites participating, mostly universities. In those days, when the early services that underpinned the internet like BGP, DNS, and SMTP were designed, the designers assumed that the operators of those services would operate in good faith. The community was small and everyone knew everyone else, or at least knew where to find them. As the years passed, more and more people gained access to the internet, and the strong identity and responsibility around using and operating services began to erode. Today, many critical internet services rely on simple access control to secure them from attack, and much effort is expanded, expended in the resultant arms race between people trying to profit from attacking the internet and those trying to defend it. Next topic. The challenges of a centralized trust model for IoT. Fast forward to today, and with the IoT, we're trying to extend the internet with all its native trust in the network to tiny designs with little RAM and a very thin pipe back to the internet, the big problem of internet security doesn't fit well on a microcontroller. One way of solving this is to introduce a trusted party that the devices look to for instructions and relay all their traffic through. By necessity, these systems are a centralization point. Everyone has to agree to use them, or they have to be federated. IoT's track record on federation at this point is abysmal. Almost every IoT system to date requires customers to delegate trust to a service offered by the vendor. Additionally, many of these systems, the gateway device that bridges the wireless protocol and the internet protocol, also occupies a trusted position, or at least it is not an open access routing device, meaning only works, it only works for devices using the same trusted party. This is fine, but it's not how the internet works. The internet, for all its flaws, is still a decentralized system. You can operate on the internet with very little dependence on a trusted party. Your laptop works fine at home on a Comcast internet connection, and it works fine when, you're, when you hotspot with your ANT phone. Your laptop doesn't care, or need to care. How it's connected to the internet, IoT devices today are not like this. They might speak the same wireless protocol, unlikely, but two products from two different vendors are very unlikely to interoperate. Additionally, if your neighbor has the same IoT device as you do, your device won't use his gateway if the cat pulls the plug out of yours, nor vice versa. This is not an internet of things, it's something else. And for those that don't understand, IoT, internet of things. Next paragraph. Rethinking the Internet of Things. Helium was founded with the idea that an Internet of Things that was publicly accessible and ubiquitous should exist as a public commodity. Unfortunately, even we fell into the trap of centralizing around a trusted party, namely ourselves. While we were never entirely comfortable with the idea, it was difficult envisioning how an alternative could work. About a year ago, we had to, and this is not about a year ago, it's because this article was written in 2018 so we can say roughly about 2017 uh, they had to deep rethink about what we were offering and how it differed from what we offered what we wanted to offer a crowdsourced network of open access gateways that users could depend on and gateway operators could be rewarded for maintaining now that is awesome that is what is happening in the helium community right now they're incentivizing people with HNT for helping us build this network continuing on we also wanted to let users operate their own infrastructure or use ours if they trusted us. How do you build a trustless IoT network though? At the time, blockchains had come back into vogue and we had many joking discussions about merging blockchains and IoT. Finally, though, we had a really interesting insight. What if we could replace Bitcoin style proof of work with something useful and relevant to the IoT? What? Fundamentally, Bitcoin style proof of work is about defeating Sybil attacks? Sybil? Sybil? Damn. I should have figured that word out. I think it's civil. Civil attacks. That's what we're going to go for. And if I'm incorrect on pronounce, uh, saying that, um, whatever. A uh, civil attack is when... I don't like saying civil. For some reason, I don't think it's civil. Cybel? A cybel. A cybel. A cybel. 
I'm sorry. Cut. Rewind. Fundamentally, Bitcoin, style of proof of work, is about defeat and civil attacks. A civil attack is when a single actor creates many sock puppet accounts and exploits majority rule voting to overrule the true majority of actors. Proof of work uses the fact that a CPU, GPU, ASIC can only be solved in one puzzle at a time. Solving several puzzles at once would reduce the speed of the computation. This means that a miner can realistically only be mining on behalf of one identity at a time. This allows proof of work style blockchains to defeat this type of attack strategy because mining on top of the block the miner thinks it is the tip of the chain is an activity not interchangeable with mining on top of another block or mining under another identity. This effectively means that Bitcoin and other proof of work style blockchains rely on the fundamental limits of computation. Although our own technological limitations get in the way first to construct an unforgeable identity. Next paragraph. Defining the first blockchain, proof of work for wireless. The challenge we pose ourselves is what does a quiv equivalent to proof of work look like in the world of radio? In radio, there are several fundamental limits. RF, energy propagates at a maximum speed, the speed of light. It dissipates over distance, inverse square law, and emits from a point source, the antenna location. Happily, these limits are well understood and improvements in technology are unlikely to change them, unlike computational bounded proofs of work, whereas a new ASIC can make hardware obsolete overnight. And we've seen that happening in the mining community. And if anybody has done any type of crypto mining, they know that you can get something today and a few weeks, few months, or even a year from now, that ASIC could be POS. But they can also come back. So yeah continuing on initially we wanted to build a network around an erc20 token but several requirements made that very difficult first erc20 tokens are pretty much by design pre-mined we'd have to build a smart contract to pay out mining rewards from a pre-mined pool writing a secure smart contract is still far from a solved problem and the stakes are high second the storage on the ethereum blockchain is extremely expensive so we have to store a lot of things off chain which defeats the purpose of building a decentralized system and finally, Ethereum is SLOW on the order of five to seven transactions per second across the entire Ethereum network. And we know that is being, that's being worked on for Ethereum, um, and there are changes to combat that. Because, you know, I don't want to knock ETH. I like ETH. But it is what it is. And this picture here, for anyone watching the video, this is the Helium Gateway design, includes a software-defined radio, allowing it to listen on many channels simultaneously and determine a highly accurate timestamp of when transmissions were received. That's such a beautiful design. Continuing on. After a lot of thinking, false starts, and whiteboarding, we've come up with a way to turn our gateway's access to radio equipment and location into a proof of coverage suitable for use as an identity. Essentially, Helium Gateways assert their location according to the GPS coordinates. Now, that doesn't mean there's a GPS tracking device on the gateway. Essentially, the lat and long, your GPS coordinates, are what's used to assert that location. Continuing on. And other Helium gateways routinely challenge these gateways to prove their location. Knowing where, when, and how strongly a signal was received allows us to verify the transmitter location. Over time, with enough successful responses to these challenges, the gateways can create a strong identity with an associated trust score that we can use to defeat the civil attacks. Now that's really awesome because this is what's going to be beneficial to the IoT and in technology in the future. Um, we'll be able, as more and more data uh, becomes available, understanding how to, to uh, geolocate without a GPS tracker. Um, will be pretty pretty awesome and it's something that uh, a lot of people are working on right now how to track an asset without a GPS because a gateway is anchored in space and only a single gateway can occupy a point in space we don't allow two gateways to claim the same location these identities are also unique which is why it's extremely important that we place these hotspots in you know 300 to 350 meters apart from each other so I'm gonna read that one more time because a gateway is anchored in a space and only a single gateway can occupy a point in space, we don't allow two gateways to claim the same location. All right, so each hexagon, all right, the grid, the H3 grid that we use, each hexagon has a density target. And if you've seen any of my other videos where I'm always watching Cryptechology, I just want to say thank you for supporting my channel and thank you for hitting that like button. The, the, the h and reward is for building the network not for mining always remember that 
It's to build the infrastructure, not to mine. And last, what about consensus? Now that we've addressed this attack problem, we need to return to consensus. In proof of work style consensus, also called Nakamoto consensus, because the proof of work is probabilistic, at any point in time, the next Bitcoin block is 10 minutes out, even if it's been 10 minutes since the last block. It's fine to have a first seen block wins approach. Once you have a determin deterministic proof of identity, you no longer want to just wait for the first proof seen because proofs now have relative value outside of their order of arrival. In Helium's blockchain, we've ranked the proofs in order of how much they tell us about the network and the, trustwor the trustworthiness of the reporter. An additional aspect to consider is because our proofs now have value. They all tell us something about the network. You don't want to discard proofs that didn't win. This means that simply Nakamoto consensus is not suitable. We explored using Ethereum style, and while that did work, it added a significant amount of complexity and overhead. Another aspect we considered was to make certain kinds of transactions quote unquote free, as in free of transaction fees. This is important if you want to, to account per packet, because not only do we want to keep a trace that the packet was sent on the blockchain for proof of location transmission of the transmitter, but we also want to enable a pay as you go settlement scheme rather than a prepay or pay in arrears settlement scheme. This requires the ability to have a transaction per packet, or at least a transaction every n number of packets. Miners in a blockchain system are not your friend. They cooperate as long as it is in their interest to do so, and as we can see with other chains. Typically, they will do the bare minimum, bend or break the rules, censor transactions, etc., as long as they can still get paid. This is why most blockchains have transaction fees. They're the bribe to incent the miner to include the transaction in the block. However, this is in direct conflict with the desire to provide microtransactions for packet transport. So, struggling with both the issues of discarding useful proofs and providing transaction fee free microtransactions, we discarded our Ethereum style blockchain approach and went back to the drawing board. And those are the reasons why Helium had to come up with their own blockchain and why they didn't go ahead and quote unquote fork fork from another uh, chain, which was mainly Ethereum or utilize Bitcoin strategy. So they had to come up with something on their own. So let's figure out how they came up with that. Choosing a hybrid consensus model for speed and scalability. One interesting approach we found was Bizon was Bizcoin, which used Nakamoto style consensus to bootstrap a practical Byzantine fault tolerant PBFT consensus system. This type of system has the advantage of not only being resilient to civil attacks, but also confirming transactions at a very high rate, which is critical for scalability. One big problem with Nakamoto consensus as you tie the proof of identity to the confirmation of the transaction. Even worse, because Nakamoto consensus is not very tolerant of net splits or chain forks, if a fork occurs, eventually it will be resolved simply by deleting the losing fork. This means that if you're on the wrong side of a network partition, or if you're connected to a malicious peer on the blockchain, your transaction might look like it has been added to the chain, even with several blocks on top. But there's no guarantee that a longer chain doesn't exist elsewhere that will appear later and supersede it. These so-called hybrid consensus models like Bizcoin are very interesting and are on the cutting edge of blockchain research. After researching Bizcoin, we also found another paper with the amazing name of Honey Badger BFT. Honey Badger is really interesting as it has two rare properties. It is asynchronous and it is censorship resistant. Asynchronous means that it can tolerate arbitrary delays on messages being delivered. This is helpful for us as we expect gateways to be spread around the world with varying qualities of backhaul. Asynchronous systems also uh, are also less successable, successable to denial of service DOS attacks, where you can cause a system to crash by flooding it with traffic. With censorship resistance, as long as one member of the consensus group is honest and a, and a user submits their transaction to that honest node, the transaction will eventually be accepted. Honey Badger manages this with clever use of threshold encryption, and as a result, it's very difficult for miners to ignore transactions they don't want to include in the next block. Now here we go. The cream of the crop. The golden ticket. Designing the Helium blockchain. So. Helium's hybrid blockchain system looks like this. Every epoch, the best n 
n being the number, the best n number of proofs of coverage from the last epoch are used to elect the members of the honey badger consensus for the next epoch. Let me say that one more time. So Helium's hybrid blockchain system looks like this. Every epoch, the best amount, pr the best n proofs of coverage, the best number of proof of coverage from the last epoch are used to elect the members of the honey badger consensus for the next epoch. So they're taking the, the, the hotspots that gave the most reliable proof of coverage results and from that group, they're electing the members for the consensus. The elected members then run a distributed key generator to bootstrap their threshold encryption keys and then launch into the Honey Badger consensus protocol. The Honey Badger consensus protocol in brief looks like this. Each member accepts transactions until they have at least B transactions in their queue. Each member then selects B divided by N from the first B transactions in the queue. It then encrypts them with the threshold public key and gossips that encrypted data around. Once N dash F, where F is the failure threshold, so at one, once N minus F members have all shared their proposed transactions, they are all threshold decrypted at which point it is too late to censor them. The transactions are duplicated or deduplicated. Invalid ones are removed and they're combined into a new block. This block then acts as a threshold signature applied to it. Members trying to censor transactions will end up with a different block than honest nodes. And thus their signature shares won't be valid. And then that's how they're gonna distinguish between good, good actors and bad actors or one of the ways rather. Um, on the network. Thus, with all this work, Helium has designed a blockchain around a self-verifying network of gateways that provide message, providence, microtransactions, and open access to anyone. Our proof of work replacement is useful, indeed valuable, as it is a historical record of the state of the network as well as a very recent view of its current status. Users can consult the blockchain to see where coverage is in near real time and what is cost. Gateway operators can see where business opportunities for more or cheaper gateways are. This coverage in real time also has the benefit of delivering geolocation capabilities without the need of expensive and battery consuming GPS. We believe the Helium blockchain enables a purpose built decentralized machine network and solves the centralized trust problem that has plagued the industry and stalled its growth. Well, I hope you guys really enjoyed this Helium blog, Introducing the Helium Blockchain by Andrew Thomas, or Thompson, excuse me. Stay tuned for more videos of going through the Helium blog. Also, I'll be posting another video of the interview with Amir Halim from Blockchain and Booze by Adam Levy, or Levi, or Levy, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. So, yeah, so stay tuned for those videos. Um, I will be posting those shortly and also stay tuned for more information on the Helium blockchain. So I'm Simon and you're watching Cryptechology. Hey, if you like what you uh, just heard or saw, please hit that like, subscribe button, you know, do the YouTube thing. And if you want some awesome crypto apparel, then watch that video next and get some exclusive epic gear today. Don't delay. Buy today. Dogelord.com. Yeah, we're doing it. Yeah, we're doing it. We got the crypto apparel on lock. All right, y'all. I'll catch you on the next one. Um, this is where you go. Don't delay. Buy today. Get your crypto apparel today. Now, head on over to that search button. Type in future self. And you can check out the newest and hottest, most exclusive crypto apparel out there. This is for the IoT crypto world. Do you want to look fresh? deploying your helium hotspots well you can go ahead and get yourself some future self gear and look professional today actually not professional look fresh look epic